Thank you very much. So I'd like to acknowledge um, my co-authors, Chris Vim, Charmaine, and Ramesh, who are part of the design team in mechanical engineering. As much as I'm presenting this, and this is located in the course that I'm primarily responsible for teaching, the revision of this, as we all know in MechEng, is very much a team affair. So I really need to acknowledge that. Also, as I see lots and lots of very familiar faces in the audience, I'm going to take certain liberties in terms of, um, I'm not going to leave out things that other people might not know, but that I might be a little bit less formal in some of my expression, uh, or, or dig a little bit deeper, because people will know what I'm on about. So when we talk about a design course, we really have to start with the, the design process. And I've given it in the more generic form over here, rather than that specific to engineering, because we see the design process and design thinking cropping up in many, many other spaces as a structured problem-solving process. And it, the fact that we have a, a design school at the business school and that people think about design thinking while designing social science experiments tells you how valuable this process is. Um, and it, it's really those five fairly simple steps of defining a problem quite clearly before you begin to produce solutions. Um, and then iterating through this process of completing a solution and then interrogating it, testing it very, very rigorously um, to be able to improve on the next cycle. And to me as a teacher of design, this is something that's really, really important. Getting students to realize that you cannot expect to step in a constantly forward fashion towards a complete ideal solution, not in the real world, right? Maybe in an idealized classroom scenario where we create very artificial boundaries, that can happen. But in the real world, most of the time, you haven't realized what the real problem is that you're trying to solve, where your blind spots until you've been through the process once. And it's when you've been through the process once and you've built your solution and you're testing it that you start to see the things that you couldn't see at the beginning. So getting students to see it as this iterative and structured problem solving process is really, really important. And that's valuable for anywhere. So some of the course context to what we're doing. I'm responsible for the second year design offering in mechanical engineering. It is core to both of our programs, the mechanical and the mechanical and mechatronics program. It's currently a 16 credit second semester course. That stays the same, though we're doing a major update in 2019 as part of our broader curriculum revision exercise. And that involves this course and, and things that we do with how we deliver material within this course. So some of the aims of this course. As I mentioned earlier, we really want to get students comfortable with this idea of design as a structured decision-making process and one that you cycle through. Go through it more than once. Don't try to just do it right the first time. Also, very importantly, we need to introduce the fundamental machine elements, things like gears, bearings, nuts and bolts, etc. As much as there are lots and lots of other tools, lots of other things that engineers do, at the end of the day, the mechanical engineers are the ones who will have to make decisions about these things wherever they are. So this is where we get students used to the idea of how do you make basic calculations about these things? How do you build 3D CAD models? From those 3D CAD models, generate engineering drawings that are used to make things of these. Though these days, the 2D paper drawing is, I wouldn't say rapidly disappearing, but more and more in industry, the 3D CAD model is what is used to actually build that. So that's some of the context for what, what I teach. And graphically, here are some examples of things that we would do. So one of the long-standing assignments in this course has been for students to do a gearbox design of some kind because it involves all of these machine elements. They need to learn how to put them all together. They need to learn how to do some calculations leaning on the vector mechanics they get from physics, mathematics, their, their mechanics courses, etc. They need to do some speed and ratio calculations of things, build a CAD model. They never get to building a metal version like that in the course, but that would be a typical teaching model that I do bring into class. Now, uh, things that I've noted, many, many of our students struggle to relate 
that sort of quite idealized mathematical theory to what's going on over there. Right? And that, that's really more of a classical mechanics issue than necessarily a design issue. And something else that they're all, even the good students, really, really struggle with is this idea of the practicalities of design. I will say to students, you can, you can do beautiful calculations right, and define everything perfectly, but if you hand me a design that we can't assemble and we can't manufacture, it's useless. All right? that, that should be a fail on an assignment. And many of them do fail on that because they go, oh, well, you know, I've put that screw in there, but how do I get the screwdriver to there? in the first place, right? Or how do I get that wheel in there? There's a shaft that goes through and then they just hand wave their way and they build a beautiful CAD model and it's all great until somebody takes their CAD model in their fourth year or when they arrive in industry and says, now build this thing and you discover that you can't. So at that stage, at a second year course, those are some of the things that I'm really getting students to, to grapple with. Um, so there is this uh, sense that a lot of the issues that they have with the practicalities, the assembly, the manufacturers, due to a fundamental lack of familiarity with these things. Many, many students say to me that when you, I, I'm famous for taking things to class and we'll have a slide with gears up on the board and I will hand out examples of those gears and students will say to me, that was the first time I touched something like that, right? I had no idea, when people talked about ball bearings, I had no idea that that's what the inside of them looked like until you took one apart and, and said, here, go look at this thing. Uh, that's interesting to me that uh, I, I had quite a different background to these things, but this lack of familiarity of our students with these mechanical things is A, not new and not specific to South Africa. The reference I found below, Laman Kuso, who is writing about the mechanical program at Penn State University back in 1996 was noting the same things. Students don't have this familiarity and it challenges them now when they have to worry about these things. So there are a bunch of what I'm calling external barriers to these things. Things that um, they're, they're happening to students or not happening to students before they arrive at university. Uh, there's the standing joke from some of my professors that 30, 40 years ago, everybody in first year mechanical engineering could probably change the oil and the spark plugs on their own car. Not completely not true anymore, just isn't the case. And there's numbers of reasons for this. At home, students aren't exposed to these things. It's taken me an incredibly long time to realize how different my experience was. My dad used to make me hold a torch while he fixed the leaky pipe under the sink or change the washer on the tap. And I learned from that. I was completely conversant in what the names of tools were as a result of that. So many students don't have that. And it's squeezed on both ends of the socioeconomic spectrum. A family that is very wealthy will simply hire a plumber or hire an electrician to come and do that job. And you don't leave your child to be babysat by the hired help in those circumstances. In our disadvantaged communities, people might not have the product itself, or they might not have the tools, and therefore they don't engage with it. And so children don't see these things at home. We've seen a definite shift in schools as to what subjects are taught. I remember doing woodwork at school up until about the age of 11 or 12, and then it fell away. Metalwork in high school was seen as something that <coughs> technical or trade schools did. If you went to a well-to-do high school that was focused on getting you into university, you didn't, you didn't go into shop class, as it's called in the US. In good schools now, when students do things like these, the design and technology classes will tend to focus on computers and electronics more than you know, how do we take apart a piece of machinery. And a, a lot of the hobbies or pastimes involved in these things have serious cultural associations. I recall a conversation with a bunch of students in our lab around a racing buggy that, that sits in our lab, and some of the students were super excited about it because they were motor racing fans. One of them used to take apart his motorcycle on weekends. Another student had a cart that he raced, all those sorts of things. We had a great conversation about it. And there was another student involved in the conversation who came to me afterwards and said, 
I'm not a motor racing fan. I never watched Formula One with my dad on a Sunday afternoon. I didn't, didn't engage with these things. Am I, you know, does this now mean that I can't be as good an engineer as the person who, who did take apart their dirt bike with their dad on a Saturday? And that was really, really telling for me because while I didn't, you know, I didn't watch Formula One with my dad, I had these other experiences with my dad that built these skills. Uh, I did have access to tools. I was allowed to play with tools unsupervised, which a lot of people aren't allowed to do. And so those skills were there. There's a huge can of worms around students who come into engineering studies knowing at the beginning they don't want to be practicing engineers but they see a BSc engineering degree as a route to something else. And as I said, it's a huge can of worms. I'm not going to get into it for this particular talk. So we recognize that we've got to do something at the university level to give our students that practical experience, give them that exposure, because they're going to battle with design if they don't get that exposure. In the past, this was very much in the form of vacation training experiences, internships, where students went and spent their holidays at engineering companies in their workshops. The problem with that is that there are huge, huge differences in student experiences. Students who went to some companies where, where they had bursaries, they didn't have a choice, where there were large corporate offices, those students sat at a desk and weren't allowed into the workshops, weren't allowed onto the factory floor to get those kinds of experiences. Other students did go to places which had a lot more practical things to learn, but because of socio-cultural interactions, they came from a particular space, and the people who worked in the very blue-collar jobs in those space came from very different communities. There were cultural clashes, and as a result, they weren't able to learn. What we can recognize is that the workshop training is very much outsourced learning, and it, it's incredibly hard for us to justify how such an important part of our students' learning sits outside of our control somewhere else. And so we really need to have a change in that. We have discussed the ideas of more in-house workshop or machinist training as a formal course. The problem with this is that it is prohibitively expensive. When you have students working with machines or welding, you have to give them very close supervision to make sure they don't hurt themselves. All right? You also need a huge capital outlay so that you have enough machines that you can train a reasonable number of students on. The other question is we don't, we don't need our students to become an expert machinist or a welder. That, that isn't, it helps if you have that background a design, as a designer, but if you actually just know how does the pieces of the machine fit together, can you take it apart? Do you understand how to work with those tools? Those are really the skills that, that students need, more than knowing how do I weld these two pieces together at 90 degrees. So that exercise involves something known as product dissection, We've got a lot of other different names, teardowns, reverse engineering, etc. This isn't just an academic thing. A lot of engineering companies will do this. As soon as BMW releases a new model, Mercedes-Benz and Audi go and buy one of those, and they literally tear it down to the last nut and bolt. They're doing that for competitive analysis, but you can also do this as a learning activity. And then it's not just about take this thing apart and put it back together and make sure you don't have some loose nuts and washers on the table at the end. Students get asked questions about it that they have to answer as they go along. They have to do some kind of analysis. They might have to take some measurements of things and deal with that. Now, this is not a new thing in engineering studies. It's been happening in other universities for quite some time. Uh, Sherry Shepard at Stanford University pioneered this in about 1992. Um, I was fascinated to see the first time they ran that course, they had 10 students. 75% of whom were not engineering students taking this course in how do you take apart a bicycle and analyze it. And they did a bunch of things, things like taking apart the brake mechanism or the transmission mechanism, measuring, sketching all of these components, doing a classical mechanical analysis of the braking, ranging from the scale of the rider on the bike all the way down to the little levers and cables and understanding how do the forces interact at that level very well put together, so much so that a lot of other programs like Penn State, etc., adopted this, not quite verbatim, but they really used that framework very, very well. So it was a really good example of how do you, how do you start with that? 
as I said, we're talking here about the South African context. And as we all know, experience helps in all of these things. And so an analysis of braking on a bicycle favors people who've ridden a bicycle before. And in the South African context, how true is that for all of our students? This is not Asia or Europe where a bicycle is ubiquitous transport for anybody from the working classes up. In South Africa, a bike is more an upper-class recreational thing than a means of getting to work, as it is in other countries. One of the issues that we face time and time again is students say, that example doesn't resonate with me. I don't feel something from it. I'm unfamiliar with it. And so we looked at this example and we think, well, how many of our students will this alienate, particularly those who are already coming from disadvantaged communities? If we put them in a group, what dynamic does that set up where one student could probably strip this bike while blindfolded and bleeding from a knee because they've done it before, and another student is going, I've never sat on one of these. So while the framework is good, the specific example, not so much. So we did some more digging, and I found this uh, from Dalrymple and colleagues at Purdue University where they took a single-use film camera and had students strip it down and then look at some of the mechanical mechanisms, etc., inside. And the, the, this one was weirdly appealing to me. In an era of smartphones, I would wager that less than 1% of our students, regardless of background, have ever held one of these or ever used one of these, which means it's equally alienating for everybody, which is, in its own perverse way, kind of helpful. One of the problems with this is that the activities, the analysis of things required knowledge of photography. And if you didn't have that background, you had to give that theory in some way. So there's a time cost there because that's theory that's not really part of our class. Um, this product also, it's a single use thing. You can take it apart, putting it back together once you've taken it apart outside the factory, not so easy. So there's some challenges over there. Uh, this is a bit of an unusual one. Um, Kang and colleagues at Penn State looked at rice cookers, and they deliberately did this to surface sociocultural issues. People who are end users of this, how did they consume rice, how did they cook it, etc. It was nice from a sociological perspective, but the engineering part really was better suited to thermodynamics than machine design because of what was going on in there. So that was, was an example. Uh, I came across other examples, um, milk frothers, but nothing screams first world problems like how do you like your cappuccino? So we kind of left those off. So some, some of the considerations that we got into this, and this is always against the backdrop of South Africa and the inequality of our students and their differences in backgrounds, their, their social dynamics related to that. And questions we were asking were, when you have an example, who does it appeal to? Who would this example alienate? Who will it make desperately uncomfortable? If we have a group of students engaging with this example, what group dynamic is set up around that? Can, you, can our students link that example to prior theory easily, or can they use it to step forward and build a more general theory? There's uh, not totally inconsequential, but lesser thought of how much does each of these units cost? If I have students working with something that costs 5,000 Rand and each group manages to break one, even accidentally, I don't know whether my HOD will continue to support that endeavor. Whereas if I'm dealing with things that cost three or 400 Rand a pop, if a student breaks it, okay, not the end of the world. So some things that we're coming up with. There's a range of these that I'm going to talk through. These are more in lecture examples, artifacts that you would bring to class and you would use to aid a discussion rather than students talking through things. Kitchenware is quite a nice one. I know some colleagues have said, not all of our students have spent much time in the kitchen. I go, well, if you're 20 years old and you haven't spent some time in the kitchen, go spend some time in the kitchen. Uh, colanders are nice examples for introducing manufacturing methods and the difference between how you handle metals and plastics. Also looking at price point and durability. Plastic bottles, there is so much engineering in those plastic drink bottles, right? Or your shampoo bottle that you have at home. And that if we can get students to realize that there is engineering in the everyday things that they handle, it brings the theory that they learn a little bit closer to home. Things like sealing and fastening, 
do not have to become theoretical calculations. They're things that you can live in the everyday. This is an example which clearly I use a lot more than other people, but pretty much anybody who's been into a barbershop in South Africa has seen hair clippers that you plug into the